Good morning, men, and welcome to our pastor's panel. Not to be mistaken with the grandmaster panel, but our pastor's panel. There won't be any MC battling, not right now, not yet. Um, but what we're going to do this morning is we're going to gather some pastor friends of mine, and we're going to talk about some things that the men within our church congregation have submitted as things that they want to know and when it comes to what it means to stand for God. And so I'm going to first just start by introducing you to some of my great friends. I'm going to first start over here with Pastor Drew from Bel Air. Drew and I got to meet as we were doing a cohort together several years ago through Pepperdine University. And that was the first time I got to meet this brother. And I got to tell you, when I first met him, I knew like this brother's got some wisdom. And he's also got some things that he's already imparted to me over the years as words of encouragement that have just kept me going in my walk as I began to pastor. And then we got Pastor Chuck Hope's house. In the house, yes. Pastor Chuck and his wife, Dr. Dre, have been instrumental to us as they've been praying for us from the gate. <laughs> um, I still receive text messages from Dr. Dre yes. uplifting me on a Sunday morning. And as we've got to know each other over the years, we do a pastor's call once a month. He's been on there. Whenever he's on there, I know finally I'm going to hear some wisdom because some of these other jokers <laughs> don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Praise God. And then we have Pastor Hona from Expression 58. Ooh, Pastor sorry. Hona is incredible in the way that he loves people. Um, and that's one thing that I've admired from him uh, from afar as I've gotten to know him more as a friend. Some of the people that are dearest in my world sit under his pastorship. And I see how he's just been there to not only lead church, but lead leaders. And also he's made a big impact on me. And then we also have Pastor Julian Lowe of Oasis Church, my brother from another mother. Um, Pastor Julian and I served together at Oasis Church, which is my home church, my sending church with Pastor Philip and Holly Wagner. And he's just been a brother to me over the years and continues to be that and continues to be a, just a voice and even a prophetic voice in my life and in our church here at Redeem Life Church. And so I called him up straight up about two weeks ago. And I was like, check this out. I have an idea if we could come together and rap a bit. And I just knew it wasn't going to work because these men right here have very full lives. And I knew God was involved when they all said yes. And we all managed to have a time to come together and speak. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Julian as I've asked him to kind of lead our panel discussion. Um, why? Because he's great and I want it to be on him. No, um, because he's awesome and he's willing to do it. So thank you, Pastor Julian. Thank you for leading this conversation. This is great. Uh, the good news about the questions that the men of ROC have come up with is that there's a lot of great questions. The bad news is there are no softball questions. <laughs> like these questions are no joke. Give us your theology on angels. You know, just like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> no, but no, there's a lot of great questions on here. But we're going to start off with one that I think is probably a question that, you know, pastors or people um, would get asked a lot. This is even a question that gets Googled a lot. Mm. And it is, um, how do you know the difference between pursuing God's will and pursuing your own will as a man? Uh, Pastor Anthony, I would love for you to, to give your That's advice on that. Know. How dare you? Break it really? Down. Throwing it down, at me right it. off the bat. <laughs> well, when it comes to pursuing God's will and not my will, there's a couple things that I know I've set up in my life that help me kind of navigate that question. One is, is the will of God, the thing that I feel led to do, does it line up with who God is and the character of who God is? Second, as I surround myself with people that will speak into my life, that will tell me the truth, not just tell me what I want to hear. Because um, I'm an ambitious dude. I've got some dreams and some ambitions and some things that if I don't keep them in check, will be motivated about the glory that it gives me and not the glory that it gives God. And so I'm making sure that I'm insulating myself, surrounding myself with people that know God, people that hear from God, people that spend time with God. So as I'm sharing what I believe is God's will for my life, there's some confirmation and there's some affirmation. And one thing that I know has served me over the years as I'm navigating that, what is God's voice, what is God's will? is knowing that if I step out in faith, I'm trusting God, it's lining up with the words of scripture, I've gotten the wisdom of a multitude of counselors, and I take a step of faith, like take the fear factor out of it that if somehow I, I misstep, that I've lost it all. I think sometimes in this world, there's this fear of this permanence, that if I make this wrong mistake right now, it's all gone. Everything's ruined. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm never going to get it back. And I just don't see that in Scripture. In fact, I see quite the opposite. God is a redeemer. God is a restorer. So when I take that pressure off of uh, just step out, 
trust God. I've done all that I know to do. I, I sense that this is the spirit of God speaking to me. I've got it confirmed with other brothers in the faith, sisters in the faith, that this That's is the, the voice of God speaking to me. Step out and then expect the waters to part. And if they don't, brother, step back and go back to the last thing God told you to do and stay faithful at doing that. That's great. That's great. How would you approach that, Pastor Drew? You know, I love how you ended that, to step out in faith and the waters will part. And we've got to remember that 38 years before that moment, before Joshua and the priests and the Ark of the Covenant enabled them to step into God's promises, that same invitation was given to Moses. Numbers 13 and 14, God says to Moses, okay, now's the time. I want you to go into the promised land. This is my will. We're talking about God's will, right? So he sends out 12 spies. Mm -hmm. 10 of them come back. Yeah. They're afraid, the giants in their mind. And so what I've understood to not be God's will is either the comfortable way or the convenient Talk way. Talk about it. That's really Talk good. Talk about it. Or the crowded way. Yeah. Because wow. then the whole crowd, 10 of the 12, are like, no. That's not the way to go. We should go back to Egypt. And the whole of the nation of Israel weeps. You can read about it in Numbers 14. Mm -hmm. And they say, we've got to go that way. We've got to go the opposite of God's will. And the crowd led the nation of Israel the wrong way. And 38 years go by. There's consequences when we chose our way rather than God's way. And I think Psalm 37.4, for me, is such a beautiful reminder when we delight ourselves in the Lord. Come on. Now, God will give us the desires of our heart. When I was a kid, I thought that that meant he'd just give me whatever I wanted. Yeah. Right. No, he changes the things that you desire, mm -hmm. and you begin to want and long for and desire for God's will. But we've got to delight in the Lord first. And we do that in worship. We do that in prayer. We do that yeah. in Christ-centered community. The men that are choosing to do this on a Saturday, among all the other things, you're delighting in the Lord. Yeah. And God will give you the desires of your heart. Wow, the comfortable way, the crowded way. Step it. This is this is great. Were you going to say something, Pastor Charles? He's like, going to say how deep he is. <laughs> <laughs> and I had nothing to say. Yeah. I do want to just say, I think as men, we have to be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. What do we desire in life? And I, I look to, and what you guys said was fantastic. I also, I also want to add that the witness of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we know, we know the right answer. <laughs> we know the right mm -hmm. direction, but we don't want to go that direction like it's, it's comfortable or crowded. But oftentimes there's a urging, a longing, or a push, or a pull, or whatever you want to call it in your heart, that says, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. And if you just get quiet and let God speak to you and uh, solidify that thing, then you'll make the right decision. But whether it's the job decision, the house decision, who to marry type of thing, yeah. you know, you know, you know something more than right. you give God credit for sometimes. So just be honest with yourself also. Honest. Yeah, that's great. I also think, too, that um, oftentimes we talk about the enemy of our faith being doubt, mm -hmm. but sometimes the enemy of our faith is clarity. Mm -hmm. meaning that you don't want to pursue something unless you're sure. Yeah. And wow. so sometimes God has made me really clear about something. Mm -hmm. And now he's asking me to step out on faith and he's not giving me the clarity that I once had. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I'm not sure, maybe take the word pursued out and, and say, how do I discover God's will? Good. Because That's when good. you're pursuing God's That's will, good. you're usually thinking that God's will is not where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so I have encountered God's will a lot, not through pursuit, but curiosity and discovery for where I'm at. So instead of like, you might feel called to do something, but you're working at Starbucks. What is God's will for me at Starbucks? Amen. Because discovering God's will at Starbucks and in the place I don't want to be in is helpful. And one of my sure things about if it's God is if I agree, it's probably not him. <laughs> <laughs> because whatever he asked me to do, that is never what I had in mm. mind. But if you, God tells you something, you go, that's a great idea. <laughs> Definitely want to check that with your pastors, <laughs> leaders, and friends. All right. <laughs> Pastor Hona, um, another great question on here. And I know it's been a tough time, you know, financially with COVID and everything. But one incredible man of God wants to know, how can we stand in God's promise and provision when facing financial devastation in today's uh, uncertain time? Mm. Hmm. Yeah, you know, one thing that I've been thinking a lot, a lot about, 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 especially in the season where there's so much that is unknown and there's so many things that that we couldn't predict. Um, it to me is like, uh, the invitation of God of like, uh, are you willing to trust me when 
things go completely the opposite way when unexpected things happen. You know, I feel like being grounded in God is, some, is you know, the foundation is, is, is a, you know, Jesus is a rock, right? And we, we, we tell stories about, you know, the storm's coming and the house blowing and, you know, mm-hmm. are we in the rock, right? And, and, but the reality is that we never get to know really, truly, if we are actually grounded in the rock until actually the storms come. Truth. And so I feel like circumstances shouldn't, shouldn't change uh, you know, um, where our faith is uh, holding on to. Uh, and so, you know, I grew up as a missionary kid. So, I, you know, there was days that there was a, a plenty. There was days there was none. And then in, in all of it, and I always remember my dad just talking about Paul, how he said, you know, we need to learn how to thrive when there's plenty and when there's lack. And so I think as Christians, you know, it's, it's just, it just, it, it becomes another, almost like an offering to God where, where we can believe and, 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 and be fully secure in who he is when things actually are going wrong mm-hmm. you know because it proves something that we're not we're not it proves uh it proves a ground in this in us that uh we only get to do in the side of eternity right we get to love god and worship god and follow god in the side of eternity when things are hard you know one day it's all going to be great <laughs> and it's all going to be awesome and so i felt like you know uh the, the 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 thing is like how do we turn to this place where circumstances don't get to shake us the way that they have had in the past you know like how do we get more grounded what would you say to that pastor Trump? you know i was thinking uh uh I haven't been hit as hard financially because I've been working my other job and all this fun stuff, but I know people who have. And I think this is an opportunity. When, when crisis comes, there are also opportunities. And there's preachers could give all kind of great cliches about, you know, uh, crisis and all that stuff. But I think that uh, we have an opportunity to lean on the body of Christ more, to lean on our communities more uh, when we have times of need, whether it's emotional need, whether it's financial hardship, whether it's... Um, uh, economic challenges, that we have a body of believers we can look to or cling to or go to to get resources, help, and assistance. And I think that's one thing God is wanting us to do, even as people are leaving church <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, especially in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, I think God's still calling us back to community. And I think that's one way to at least the how-to get through those times. Man, that's a great thought. And uh, <laughs> One of the things I think about with that, and I want to ask you this, Pastor Anthony, is like uh, culturally, you know, I remember um, love songs growing up in the 80s where the woman would sing a love song about the man. The man would sing the love song about the woman. And then it was like, I don't want no scrubs. Scrub is a guy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, And then yeah. Beyonce said, to the left, to the left, throwing her brother out, which means culturally she owned the house, then right. kicked the brother out the house. And then obviously with urban, you know, culture, and there's this, this pervasive thing in culture about mm-hmm. manhood is having money. Mm. Do you feel like that is participating um, in, in maybe someone who's watching feeling like they don't have enough when it's been uh, so much in culture now switching to if you don't have money, you're not a man? Absolutely. Like so much of, I think men in our day get our value based on what we acquire. Yes. The materials that we have, yes. the reputation that we have, which tend to be linked back to what we've acquired. Right. And all of a sudden that becomes our place of value versus our sonship and who God calls us to be. And so then when we put our place of value in these things that we accumulate in the natural, like we actually step out of God's. We step out of the ability to remain under God's covering where I believe that he can actually bless us in the supernatural. And I, and I even love what Pastor Charles said, um, by staying connected to the church, by staying rooted in the vine, we can reestablish our true identity, which is not in the world. The world's definition of what a man is, is not God's or the Bible's definition of what a man is. Um, the world says, like, be all man. You don't need nobody. Do you? Right. Bro. Right. Um, right. Right. And right. that's not at all. When we go to the scriptures, what we see, we see men who know when they're in trouble, uh, men who have men that are gathered around them. I, I think of uh, the story in the Gospels of the, ma- the paralyzed man on the mat. And Jesus is speaking in the house and he's got a mat squad of brothers who are real, who are like, hey, you need help. So guess what? We're going to take you on top of this roof. Wow. We're going to dig a hole and we're going to lower you down. And I think, thank God that brother had some men in his life who understood what it meant to help somebody else in distress. Yeah. And I love Jesus' response. He says, it's their faith that has essentially made yes. you well. So 
when I'm thinking about how am I getting my value? Am I getting it from the mighty dollar? Am I getting it from the paycheck? Am I getting it from these things that the world says is how you should value yourself? Or am I getting it from who God says I am, mm. which is I ain't got to do nothing. I ain't got to earn nothing. Be a man, but trust God for the provision that he provides. Yeah, that's so good, Pastor Anthony. And um, I always think about provision in Genesis chapter 22. It's where the first time God is referred to as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Mm. And so throughout thousands of generations, we now say, God, your name is Jehovah Jireh, mm. the Lord will provide. But if you look at that passage of scripture, that passage of scripture comes on Abraham's taking Isaac up the mountain, and there's a ram in a thicket, and he, the Bible says that he named the place the Lord will provide. He did not call God that. He named the place of sacrifice the Lord will provide. Shoot. And so there's men, if we're not willing to be at pl in that place, yep. we'll never know God by that name. Mm. You get the revelation of God as your provider by being in the place of sacrifice. And that place is so excruciating. Mm. We think that God's not providing. But to your point, that's where we find out yes. that God is our provider by being in this place that we don't want to be in. Right. And so a lot of times we can get preventative mm. and not wanting to be in that place. But that's how you discover yeah. that God is your provider, by being in that place. And so I think it's, it's really important. Pastor Drew, I'm coming to you next because now we're about to get deep. Come on. You know, we're about to get, we, we, we got to come to Pastor Drew. I'm coming to you first because that last answer, that's what you get for giving that answer about Caleb in the wilderness. <laughs> that's what you get. You, 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 you came through on your first, I'm coming to you with this one. So, you know, hopefully you got something in numbers ready. That's all I know in numbers. That's all yeah. I know in numbers. Yeah, you're going to have to go to Deuteronomy something. Matter of fact, you might have to go to Ezra on this one. I don't know. How do you as pastors decide what to stand for in this hostile political state, knowing it may be seen as divisive by some in the church? Mm. Pastor Drew. He getting with a mmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> So let me just for 60 seconds share my context. Yes, please. So I'm a third generation Angelino. I came to Christ in college at a church called Bel Air Presbyterian Church that I'm now the senior pastor at. Wow. So seven years in, I'm serving the community that led me to Christ, changed my eternity. So I do believe the gospel is always contextualized. Mm -hmm. And so I'm speaking from my context, which is a 65 year old church that historically has been very conservative, theologically uh, and politically. And the church has changed a lot over 65 years. Yes, we are split right down the middle, conservative and liberal politically. And I've come to realize that in our context, that words that I would use out of my context, which people would understand, I would find in my context that the same word means two completely different things mm. to different groups. So if I talk about biblical justice in a sermon, I've got two different groups of people mm. who think I'm saying two completely different things. Mm, wow. If I say systemic racism, I've got two different groups thinking I'm meaning two different things. And so the complexities of that mm. caused me to realize that outside of relationship, that if we are unwilling to enter into relationships in context, to listen to one another, to learn from one another, to try to understand, to clarify, to say, no, 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 okay, now I know what you think I mean, but here's what I actually mean. Right. It's helped us enter into this in a very uncomfortable way. In a uh, seemingly divisive way, because I've got some people saying, why are you talking about this? Why don't you just preach the Bible? Okay, why don't we go to the Minor Prophets? Why don't we go to the Sermon on the Mount? Okay, let's do that. And so what I found is that unless we can find our common ground in Scripture, and even deeper than that, if we can find our common ground as being one in the spirit. See, that's one of the beautiful things about the early church. They were of one heart, right. one mind, one accord, right. completely different, and yet it was through the power of the spirit. So, because you can even interpret scripture differently. Yeah. So, it's been a lot of on our knees praying, Lord, Amen. unite us, make us one, help us to listen to one another, help us to understand one another, and we've all got a lot to learn. Mm. 
and we're growing through this, but ultimately I believe that in our silence in the past that spoke the wrong thing. Mm. And so the key is, is how do we speak from a place of humility, from a place that isn't just our perspective, but God's word. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people I've experienced who listen to what they are fearful that I'm saying, and they're not listening to what I'm actually saying. And I do believe it's because, and I think this is true for a lot of Christians, mm. Jesus isn't our primary discipler. I think that there's a lot of Christians who are being discipled by our political party. Come on. And so when we're discipled wow. by our political party, wow. Wow. and then we're discipled by the media that lifts up our political party, Talk about it. then how we define words like justice, forgiveness, reconciliation, uh, whatever, <laughs> equality, all these things is not through a biblical lens. Mm -hmm. It's through another framework. And so it is complicated. <laughs> It is so complicated. He was the right one. Yeah. And I've got, I've got days where I'm like, Lord, if I could just be a post office worker, yeah. that sounds yeah. so nice. <laughs> but then the Lord's like, no, I've called you to this, you know? Have you had those moments? Wow. If I could just mow a lawn. Just see green uh, grass cut in great. even lines. <laughs> Jesus! Yeah. You know, if I can say something about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like you know, in the same way, this is a storm. You know, I, I want to, uh, the way I see it too, is like we've, we've been put through the fire in the season in many ways, right? And then in the fire, we get refined. And it is, this season has allowed things who have always been there to just come out to the surface, you know? And I think it's so key to, uh, that we, we uh, as, especially here as a, in America, as, as, as a country, uh, we don't even know where our politics uh, uh, start and where they end. It's all mixed with our Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and the problem is, is that, you know, um, you know, from whatever side you are in, you know, but that's, it's, it's just, we've had become so loyal to political parties who are systems that are broken, right? Like our mm -hmm. systems who are not, don't have the fullness of the heart of God. And so, yeah. so if we, if we actually want to move forward in a healthy way as a church, we're going to have to let go a little bit from the grip that we have to our political party mm -hmm. and choose to hold on to the kingdom of God a little stronger. Because mm -hmm. I feel like many people are holding more to their political parties than what the, what the kingdom of God, you know, is asking us to do. And so uh, I, I, I believe that as, as we hold on to the kingdom, then you stand for everything that the kingdom stands for, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that, when, when, you know, so if you, because, you know, we've experienced the same thing. We, we have a church who is split in half, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very diverse and people uh, in every kind of way. And so, but, um, you know, and, and people complain, like, why are you posting something political? And we're like, if we stand for an issue that is important to the heart of God, that is like Jesus, you know, we see Jesus standing against, against the injustice of his day constantly. If he takes a stand in love and humility, but he took a stand constantly against all the cultural things who were unjust. And so if we take a stand, you know, against, uh, uh, against something that is in the heart of God, then we're not being political, we're being kingdom. And then so people need to just uh, go back to this in places like, but if you hold on to your political party, uh, you're going to see it as political. And so everything has become political. Wow. And then we need, we need to just make that adjustment. That is really great. So good. You going to add something else? No. No. That Go ahead. So good. You were flowing. I'm taking Pastor that back Drew, to my context. <laughs> He's like, I do have something from numbers. <laughs> no, you were flowing, Pastor Drew. You got Go ahead. No, I just, I think. When you said that, it made me realize, like, there was this piece of the puzzle for me that had been missing. I didn't know how to articulate, and I feel like the Spirit brought it together in that moment when you said that, of you can speak kingdom, but people can hear it politically. Mm. And when they hear it politically, they can't hear the kingdom heart of God being communicated. And I think that takes some patience on our part. It takes prayer on our part. And to not get deterred to keep preaching the kingdom, the heart of God. Yeah. I think what Pastor Hona and Pastor Drew, you just said, when you said you can preach kingdom, but they hear it. Uh, I had written down this note, Matthew 18, verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell them. Mm -hmm. And it literally says in the ESV, and if they listen, you have gained your brother. Mm -hmm. wow. And so I think when you go into a conversation, I would say for those that like, 
uh, that are worried about divisive speech in the church. Our ears divide us more than our mouths do. Wow. Say that. The lack of listening is what's bringing the division mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not asking the second and third question. So I want to truly understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the listening that is bringing the vision, not the speech. Mm -hmm. It's the listening. At least that's what I have experienced. Um, my wife can tell me something and she can share her heart. And if I don't listen, we are divided. Yep. Every time I have listened, we have gotten to a place of unity. And when I'm thinking about whether or not I agree, we're always, it doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. But when I'm focused on listening and hearing her out and asking more questions, I think we can get to a great place of unity. Mm -hmm. These are great questions, men. We made it through that one. <laughs> Way to take it for the team, Drew. Way to take All it right. for the team. Oh, this is yeah. great. All right. <laughs> Should we go from politics to racism? Like, hey! Let's just, no. while we're here. Yeah. Since we're here. We're since, here we're, since we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Since, since we're here, let's this? jump on over to racism. <laughs> for, for 200, Alex. <laughs> Alex, I'll take racism for 500. <laughs> How has this season of racial unrest impacted you and your church? What did you do? What did you do to address it? What worked and what didn't? Pastor Charles. Wow. Contextualize, no. <laughs> I want to contextualize. We are in a mostly black church, so it's not the same. I long, part of me longs for that dynamic, but part of me doesn't. <laughs> so you're the man for the job. But I think that it's been not just this season, it's been seasons for me because after the Mike Brown incident several years ago, which seemed like forever ago, and then the Fl Fl Philando Castillo incident, we had town halls at our church to discuss these issues. Brought in professionals from the police department, brought in psychologists, brought in all kinds of folks to say, okay, how do we grapple with this? Because I've had friends who go to more majority white churches who never talked about those issues. And so I don't want to give a forum for us to have those discussions and at least kind of air out the thing. We are law-abiding black people, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're not Crips and Bloods, and we're pretty much straight arrows, you know, so we don't have the rough edge of having police harass us all the time. That's not our daily experience for most folks in my church. So I feel like we were kind of preaching to the choir. We're going to be doing the right thing anyway, but we did want to talk about those issues. But this last situation was different. <laughs> I had to get in March in this one. I, I'm going to I, give me a sign. Mike, you know, mm. I had to go out in March. I felt compelled to actually go out in the street in beautiful Porter Ranch, <laughs> of all places, which I thought was amazing that there were marches in Calabasas and Porter Ranch. So I chose to participate for the first time uh, uh, as a child who's born in L.A. and Watts riots and everything, Rodney King riots, my first time really be participating. As a church, I felt we needed to be more proactive. Uh, we haven't gone out and made uh, sweeping changes to how we present the gospel. We've incorporated the messages in the gospel. We actually had a, uh, uh, what do you call a, uh, uh, a protest on our church property of doing praise and worship and a rally, as it were, on the heels of the George Floyd incident. But I think most of all, it's made us all more aware of the battle that we're in. So we haven't done anything dramatically outside because we're a black church. We're going to talk about black stuff. At the same time, our awareness level, our support of those who are doing things has accelerated more than before. So that's the biggest change. But the, what you're going through is, I can imagine, it's a whole different mm -hmm. vibe. You know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I'll open it up. Who would like to attend? I can tell you for the context within our church, we also have a multiracial, very diverse church. Um, and especially at the tales of the George Floyd incident, I preached a message, which I shared a bit of my story. Um, some of the things that I had encountered as a black man, um, what really shocked me was for many that were hearing this story from their pastor for the first time, and they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know where to place me in it because of the implications of what it would mean. Um, and it was honestly one of the most difficult seasons in ministry for me um, as I shared some of the things that I encountered. And I'm an impassioned speaker. I can get a little extra, but in, the, in a real sense of the word, I was just being fully present in the moments and sharing my story. But when some within our church saw me sharing this story in such an impassionate way, um, they didn't like it that much. Mm -hmm. I began to find myself being placed in some pretty strange categories that I wouldn't have expected to be in, meaning like, like he's just being, is that really what's going on? Does my pastor need to be cared for? 
like, oh, I, I, he really needs to look inward and see if he's had forgiveness because it happened so long ago. And so straight up what it said to me is this is why I close my mouth. Because when I share the truth in an impassioned way, all of a sudden I'm that guy. I'm that black stereotype. Um, and I was devastated um, from my own church, from people that know me, some, from people that have walked with me and we walked together for years um, that weren't prepared for that. And there was a part of me that was like, what? Y'all know I'm black, right? What do you, what do you expect? Like, I'm going to have a response. But kind of speaking to what we've all shared, there also was that moment where I realized that I didn't enter myself into a safe space to share, but a brave space mm -hmm. where the, the fact that I was sharing my experience with racism at that time, I was sharing it not only as a pastor that was leading a congregation through it, but as a son and as a black man mm -hmm. who was going through it, mm -hmm. who has three black kids um, and that this is the world they're inherited. Of course, that's going to make me feel some kind of way. Um, and there are those that just weren't prepared to let me wear a couple of those hats in the same moment. And so how that impacted our church, there are some people that were like encouraged by that, like, thank you for saying something, and others that got some of that. Can't you just preach Jesus? Mm -hmm. Or like, why has this got to be a black thing and a white thing? Why, like, what, what, where's, why can't this just be a justice thing? Um, that led to like just a series of conversations, one after the other, where I'm reaching out to those within my faith community and saying, can we sit down? I just want to listen. I, I understand you took offense to something I said. What I thought was really interesting is very few people wanted to meet with me, but a whole lot of people wanted to post about me. Um, and so when it came time to like, hey, I want to hear mm -hmm. your perspective and I just want to listen. Um, I, no exaggeration. I would say that I reached out to at least 10 people. I only sat down with one couple that had, that had really felt a uh, negative way about what was shared. And of that one couple I met with, they still go to our church and now we have a better understanding of each other. Mm -hmm. So I was challenged, the biggest way that I got rocked within my faith community is we have this, this phrase, uh, an, kind of an axiom of RLC that we've coined, legit community. We're a church that's about legit community, like real community. And I began to question the legitimacy of my community mm -hmm. because to have legit community, you actually have to be willing to sit down and talk about hard things. Mm -hmm. And there are some that were willing and there's some that weren't. Mm -hmm. And now I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I, I can't act like I don't know what I now know. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can actually pastor and lead where my church actually is. Mm -hmm. Cause I thought we were someplace else, mm -hmm. but we're not We're and, and it's okay. This is where we're at. God is still in it. God is still going to do great things, but I'm not doing anybody a good service as a pastor mm -hmm. by preaching, leading and teaching and guiding. Mm -hmm to places that people just aren't ready to go. Let's, let's be in it together and find out where, where, where you're at, where we're at together and how God wants to work in the space that we're actually at. Boy, how important for every man listening to pray for their pastor. Yes. You know, that's so complicated. You're leading and you need to be led. You're shepherding. You need to be shepherded. You're mm -hmm. healing. You need to be healed. And, it is a lonely place and you've experienced that in the last year, but I love the bravery. Like you said, just a willingness to keep showing up and uh, God's going to bless that and has, and we'll continue to bless that. That's humbling. Yeah. It's, um, you know, my pastor, um, just uh, will be 68 years old this year, pastor Philip. And, um, for the most part, it's unheard of for, a white pastor to pastor a church to a black man. It just hasn't happened. And um, he grew up in the South and uh, he remembers people in his dad's church protesting um, the desegregating. He was living in Little Rock at the time and his dad's church members along with his dad. Um, pastor Fuller remembers being taken as a little kid, um, protesting with church members, uh, the desegregation of that school in Little Rock. So the idea that all these years later he would give his church to a a black man is not a, a small thing. Wow. Um, one of the common denominators between black men who have multicultural churches, well, a frequent common denominator is they have white pastors. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to have multicultural. So there is a different weight when it's multicultural, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, Anthony ex experienced that as well. 
Um, I do think that racism is a very real problem in America, and I made that very clear. The solutions that were presented before us, um, whether it's reading books on white privilege and all this stuff, is a very real problem as well. And so that's where I navigated it. It's a, racism is a real problem, but I also believed, and one of my mentors, A.R. Bernard, I asked him, well, uh, what book should I be reading on racism? And he said, none. Until you understand scriptural and kingdom, do not zoom in on this subject until you've zoomed out on the kingdom. Wow. So when you feel that you have a wide zoom of what, of how, what is the kingdom understanding of this, then zoom in on specifics so you can interpret it through a real healthy biblical lens, not the lens of your experience. He says, do you find yourself reading books and getting mad? And I said, yes, don't read those books. Mm. <laughs> because Martin Luther King did what he did, not because he was upset at a problem, not just because of that, but he had a prophetic future that God showed him. Mm -hmm. So he was working for a prophetic future that he saw. And if you can't see that future, don't get involved in this work. And that's the advice that I've been given. Um, and so that's kind of how I dealt with it. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, I want to jump in there. I mean, I love so much what you share, Anthony, and, and what you were sharing right now too, Julian. Uh, you know, and I just want to say like, even just over and over again, I feel like I found my, 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 myself in this place where I just want to say just sorry in behalf of the church, you know, as, as a pastor, you know, when I see that we're living and experiencing these things in a day, you know, I just want to say over and over, sorry that, that you have to experience that, mm -hmm. that we are experiencing this, that many of you of the men who are listening are experiencing this and that's caused them pain in their life. Um, you know, uh, I, I love what you say about seeing where, where, where we're going and uh, something that happened to me personally, um, and this has been an issue has always been in my heart, uh, as a Hispanic, I, I, I have experienced some some level of racism, but I, I don't I don't believe it's, it's the same. I, you know, it's, it's, it's I, I you know I feel in general that I in many ways I felt like I, there was a bubble around me. You know, I didn't experience the same things that a lot of my other my brothers and my my color brothers experienced. Uh, but um, uh, the the night before George Floyd uh, was killed, I had a dream. And in the dream, uh, we were staying in this huge facility. I knew it was like a, a, a church uh, had been there. It was a white church who has been established there for many, many years. And um, in the dream, my whole family was staying in this apartment who was in the facility. And, you know, in the dream... Um, uh, this this woman who was working for the school, they, they have like you can tell they had all kinds of things going on there. And this woman came, and I realized she didn't know we were there. And so when I got up, you know, uh, to tell her that we were there, she responded in a weird in a weird way. I didn't know what was happening at the moment, but she was acting like you know we were trespassing or something. And I was like, oh no, we were invited here. I'm trying to explain this. And in my dream, I realized that at this moment, I realized that I had we had adopted a little black girl. And she comes and she grabs my hand. And the moment she did that, um, this woman just lost her mind, you know, just kind of went crazy. And so it made a whole deal like like we were like these people broke in and everything. And then I realized what the problem was. And it was it was a root of it was racism. It was what it was. Right. But in my dream, I got to see, you know, in dreams, you get to see what happens in other rooms. I got to see how the men in charge and there was this older white man in his 60s, maybe 70s. And he sat her down and he talked to her and he said, like, do you realize what you've done? Do you do you realize how offensive it is? Like, do you see what the problem in your heart is? He's like. What if your senior pastor would have been invited somewhere else and they would have stayed in, in somebody's church and somebody would have treated your senior pastor the way you treat this family? Mm -hmm. You know, and it totally convicted her and there was change that happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I woke up from the dream, right? Of course, the moment I was like, God, what's going on? Am I going to adopt a little black girl? And I'm thinking all these <laughs> things, you know, but I'm thinking, I knew that it had to do more, more than that, right? Like I knew it was more than that. But when George, um, uh, when, when George Floyd happened, I realized, I was like, God, you're asking us to adopt this issue in a different way. Wow. And I felt like God said, you know what? This is not somebody else's issue. This is my issue. Like, I want this to change. You know, I was like, it, it was just the weight of God. And what it gave me so much hope, it was that it was like, I saw this, like, like the, the, the white evangelical established church. It was like, it, it was people in the leadership who were like, they got it. 
Like I and I felt like, and I actually feel like God did that also as as as, as his as just as his goodness and mercy just for me to have faith. Because it was like suddenly I was like, I mean, I knew that people were racist, but I didn't know they were this racist. You know, it was like one of those things. Mm-hmm. That, but I it felt like God said, like, no, no, I want you to have hope because this is an issue that I want to change. Wow. Wow. That is so good, Pastor Hono. Yeah, I think it's an important conversation to continue ha- uh, happening. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, men in the body of Christ are wanting to know um, how to deal with this better. I think it's a tough subject to talk about. Some people might have uh, fatigue talking about it, but I do think the more that we have these conversations, the more um, we can all come together. Uh, I'm, I'm going to save the last questions for you, Pastor Anthony, um, mm-hmm. because I think that um, it cannot be under uh, overstated your involvement um, with uh, raising up men. Uh, I would not be the pastor of this church uh, without you. Um, your leadership and your influence uh, still uh, hold up the walls of this church spiritually to this day. And so I think that um, it's just important for you to know that a lot of times, you know, prophet's not without honor in his, in his hometown. So I don't know if your church knows who who, uh, who you really are and um, you leave a wake of, of spirit-filled people hungry um, for God. And I feel like um, the test of a true leader for men is not just the vision that they have of where they're going, but the things that they leave in their wake when they've left those places. And we are one of those amazing things. I'm going to say this question for you because it's an important one uh, before we close. What has been the biggest game changer for you when it comes to uh, growing your relationship with God? Being seen by another man of God. Um, I can remember, um, and it was at Oasis Church. Um, when I came in very broken, um, very disillusioned, um, idolizing the applause of man, the applause of the world, the ambitions of my own heart, I'm missing God the entire way, but searching and hungry, um, and never had been affirmed by a man of God who heard from God. Um, and because of my own brokenness, that is something that I was just longing to receive, even though I don't even think I knew it at the time. And I remember being in a church lobby, going to church, ready to worship God. And I remember being singled out by a pastor at Oasis who just said, hey, I see you. Mm -hmm. And who simply came alongside me and said, hey, man, like I see that God is doing something in you. um, And I'm willing to invest in you if you're willing to step up. And he did not make stepping up easy. (laughs) It was like, hey, we're going to study the word of God. We're going to pray together. Um, We're going to do everything from minister together, as well as you're going to see how I um, raised my family. His name was Pastor Gary Cooper. Um, and took me through those good times, those hard times, those in-between times. Um, was the first person to say, like, have I offended you yet? Mm. It's coming. Um, are you still going to trust God and follow God? D- didn't make it about him, but made it about the call of God in my life. Um, and called me into greatness in the kingdom. And I think far too often the world is willing to call men into greatness. And they present a story and a picture um, that is eclipsing the church, not because they have more than we have to offer, but just because the church isn't willing to step in there, get messy and call out greatness of men into the kingdom and asking them to sacrifice for it, Mm. asking them to, as Elisha, burn the plow, like have a party, give the meat out to everyone in the town and then come follow God. And this man was brave enough to say, burn it all, trust God, wow. and I'll walk with you in it. Mm-hmm. And, and that day, I wish I could say, like, I was so good. I never looked back. Brother, I was looking over. Are you sure? We going there? Oh, the whole step of the way. But he never, he never gave up on me. And then um, with that, with him and the community of men that were there, um, my pastor, Philip, as well, um, was able to continually pour into me. And, and I knew that, okay, there's something greater than I see that God has, and I'm not willing to forfeit it for the thing that is temporal that I see, that I know even now at that time was leaving me empty. Wow. Leaving me empty. And so um, it's in that spirit that I can't help but like, just get great joy out of seeing other men win. 
Like, I, I want to see a church of men that are winning. Yes. I'm tired of seeing yes. men that are in the church, yes. broke down, 12 roommates, still <laughs> living at home with their mama, still wondering, like, should I marry this girl that I've been with for seven years doing it wrong? Like, I'm ready to see some Bro, men preach. win. Preach. Like, step out in faith. Yeah, Actually sir. trust God at his word and do what you know you need to do. And we need other men calling men into that greatness. Wow. Yeah, I receive that. That's so good. That is so good. He said, like, "You got roommates." I was saying, <laughs> "So great." Hey, Pastor Drew, you mind closing us in prayer, and then we're just, of course, going to thank for the men for uh, joining us. And then Anthony, if you have any final words, I mean, uh, but uh, Pastor Drew, if you could close us, uh, close us in prayer, that'd be great. We'll kick it back to you. <laughs> well, Jesus, we thank you. You tell us uh, in Scripture where two or more are gathered in your name, you are here in our midst, and I. Thank you that you are in our midst, that as brothers in Christ, uh, we are united because of what you've done for us out of love. And I pray for each of these men. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit. Would you refresh them? Would you give them your eyes to have your perspective on the things that they're navigating in their life? And out of the overflow of that vibrant relationship, would they have a full well to pour out in love and service and humility and courage to those in their life? I pray for the men who have joined wherever they are right now, uh, whether they're on a cell phone, a laptop, Mm. uh, whatever it might be in their home, somebody else's home, an apartment, uh, you know, pulled over in a car on the side of the road. You see them, God. And because you see them, you are actively longing to communicate your heart to them. So I pray that your spirit would take the things that we shared Mm. that are from you and that they would resonate deeply in their heart. And if there was things that maybe we got in the way of what you wanted to say to them, I pray that they would just forget that. But ultimately, it would be your spirit leading them, guiding them, growing them to be men, as Anthony said, uh, who would be winning, not in the world's definition of winning, but in a kingdom win. Uh, that would be far more eternal and for, far more profound in this moment. So, Jesus, we thank you, and we give you this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, I'm going to encourage those that are watching. I know you're having breakfast. Put down your bacon. Will you just stand to your feet and applaud these pastors here for joining us at our men's breakfast? I'm serious. Get up. I see you. Get up. Get up. Just Stop applaud. Playing. Hey, because this is straight up. So kingdom right now that you guys would just take times out of your very full lives, very busy schedules. You got pastors, you're all leading churches uh, and be here with us this morning. I don't take that lightly. And I love that this is what the kingdom is about as we're building it together. It's not about those egos or logos, but the banner of Jesus. And just, I just want to thank you all for being here. But more importantly, thank you for being my friend, man. (laughs) Can we still be down? Can we still be friends? (laughs) That's it. Uh, Thank you guys for joining us. And you're going to have some questions. You're going to be talking talking in your breakout sessions about this panel and your breakout leader is going to lead you in that conversation. God bless. Was the camera wrong? Was the camera wrong?